switch it off now. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, joint work, or actually two papers, with different subsets of uh, co-authors. Uh, Dennis Elbrechter, um, who is a PhD student of Philip Grossis, who is a professor in uh, Vienna, was formerly at ETH. Uh, Gita Kutinyuk from TU Berlin. Uh, Philip Peterson, who was Gita student and Mitro Perikristenko, who is uh, my PhD student and who also generously helped me with the slides. So <clears throat> you didn't think you could just sit here and listen, right? So I'm going to make you work a little bit. Um, we just heard uh, Jared talk about classification. So here is a classification problem for you to solve. Can you help me uh, annotate uh, the images? So there's uh, four groups, uh, and uh, each group contains uh, three images. So any suggestions for any uh, people you recognize? Don't think science only. I have dark chocolate for those that uh, make correct guesses after the talk. Joachim? Gödel and Karajan, yes. Uh, then there are two more. Von Neumann, yes. So the lady, as uh, the, um, the color suggests, uh, is more recent, not science. Any uh, opera, music uh, lovers here? No. Okay, I'll show you. It's, uh, this is Elina Garancia, who is a famous mezzo-soprano. Um, <clears throat> another problem, uh, image annotation. So this is what uh, deep neural networks excel in, classification. Image annotation. Can you help me annotate this image? This is uh, to help you a little bit. He's uh, considered one of the greatest conductors of the 20th century and at the same time was the least prolific. So von Karajan said that he conducts only when his fridge is empty. Any ideas? You probably recognize uh, the background no? or the concert. It's a famous concert that you can listen to every year. The New Year's concert, yes. Sorry, in Vienna, yes, right. But we have to start with the name of the conductor. You see, uh, I, I think this just proves you, you can be a genius without being widely known. So if, if you haven't... Uh, Heard about Carlos Kleiber, I recommend uh, looking him up. Everything he ever conducted is on 11 CDs. Uh, and uh, he was known to be uh, somewhat uh, special. So he would, for example, uh, agree to conduct the Vienna Philharmonics, not for the New Year's concert, but for a regular concert. And then he would uh, come and they would have rehearsals. And then he would decide the day of the concert that they were not in good enough shape to be conducted by him. He would just uh, leave a note uh, and saying, you know, drove into the blue Carlos on the day of the performance, and uh, they would then struggle to find uh, a replacement for him. Good. Conducting the Vienna Philharmonics New Year's concert, and this is for the experts. He conducted it twice. You know, conducting New Year's concert is like winning a Nobel Prize. And so there's two years. You can actually, there's enough information on the image to tell apart. If you're interested, go to YouTube. He has uh, two concerts, uh, and uh, one is in 89, and the other one is in 92. And the way you can tell is, by the flower bouquets in the background and the colors. So this is uh, 89, and 92 was yellow and green. OK, good, but <laughs> let's get serious now. I, I also do have technical stuff to talk about. So what I would like to talk about is uh, neural networks, um, mappings, um, concatenations of uh, affine transformations, uh, nonlinearities, affine transformations, nonlinearities, and so on. So WL is an affine map. Then we have uh, what is called an activation function. Rho acts component-wise. Uh, the, uh, the quantities to keep in mind uh, in this talk are the network connectivity, which is the total number of non-zero parameters in those affine transformations, um, and defines the topology of the network, the number of layers or the depths of the network, uh, L, and the width of the network, W. 
So the, uh, the most relevant quantity for us will be m, the total number of non-zero parameters in the WLs. So what I would like to do here is um, I would like to um, isolate uh, one question, and that's uh, the question of uh, what can we learn fundamentally with a neural network. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to assume that we have, uh, I call this uh, access to infinite amounts of data, but uh, what it really means is we know the entire function that we want to learn. So you will say immediately, well, of course, this never happens in practice, yes. But this talk is somewhat information theoretic in the sense that uh, we isolate certain aspects and we ask what is possible at all. So we know the function. We have the optimal learning algorithm available. We don't care about the learning algorithm. So this talk has nothing about learning uh, from finite amounts of data. It has nothing about learning algorithms. Um, all it has is it asks um, which classes of functions can be represented uh, and uh, represented uh, efficiently as uh, a concatenation of linear transformations and nonlinearities. Okay, and what I mean by efficiently, I will tell you uh, in a second. So, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Sibenko uh, and Hornick, you will immediately say, "Well, wait a moment. What's the point of this talk? We know that uh, uh, any continuous function." can be uh, represented through a single hidden layer neural network. And that's a result that dates back to uh, 1989 for sigmoidal activation functions. So that's um, correct. What it does not tell you is uh, how the width of the network scales as a function of epsilon. So if you want to increase the precision, how does the size of the network grow? Uh, there's no result there. There is a more recent result by Lou et al. that tells you that uh, an integrable function mapping Rn to R um, can be represented through a, a real network uh, of width n plus 4 uh, with an error no more than epsilon. And uh, here, there's no bound on that. So there's uh, these two approximation results. And then there is a, you know, a whole, I mean, universe of follow-up results, um, starting with the papers by Andrew Barron in 93 and 94 uh, that gave approximation error bounds for smooth functions. And then I'm not going to read out all these references to you. And it's highly incomplete, this list. There's literally hundreds of papers that were trying to answer the question of the complexity of these networks for specific function classes. What uh, I would like to uh, uh, point out is uh, uh, results from the 1990s by Charles Choi uh, and, and also Mashkar that observed that in certain cases deep networks can perform better than single hidden layer neural networks. And there's going to be something at the end of this talk uh, about what uh, deep networks can do that shallow networks cannot do. So there's going to be some uh, precise statements in that. And uh, more recently, Eldan and Shamir, there exist functions that are expressible through small three layer networks, but only through very large two layer networks. So these are all observations uh, that speak in favor of depths. Uh, some more recent work I would like to mention uh, by uh, colleagues from uh, Zurich, Arnulf Jensen, uh, Christoph Schwab, and then Philip Gross, that uh, show that deep neural networks can break the curse of dimensionality in approximating or in solving uh, certain PDEs. Uh, the paper that inspired us for this talk uh, is a paper by Shaham Kloninger and Kaufman uh, that um, talks about uh, uh, wavelet uh, basis, approximations with wavelet basis, uh, and connects this to neural networks. So the paper, it's not very explicit, but uh, the main philosophy of our talk, it's somehow you know, quite hidden uh, in that paper. But anyway, so I saw that paper on archive, and this is what got us started. So I would like to uh, uh, encourage you to have a look at that uh, beautiful paper. Good. So um, obviously, you know, the, all these references, they um, they tell you that there should be some kind of systematic framework that asks for the, uh, the complexity uh, of the approximating network. In particular, we will, go, we will be looking at, at two different cases. One is the approximation of individual functions. For example, the first one that we'll look at is the squaring function, then the multiplication function, polynomial, smooth functions, uh, sinusoidal functions, and so on. And in that context, uh, approximation of individual functions, we're going to be interested in the number of nodes in the network needed to achieve a certain approximation error. In particular, we are going to be interested in what is called exponential approximation accuracy. The approximation error decays exponentially in the number of nodes in the network. And uh, the main statement or the main result will be that deep networks provide exponential approximation accuracy for a wide range of functions. In fact, uh, I was tempted to put here for anything you can think of, but then I, I, I wanted to be a bit more conservative. 
Okay, and the second part of the talk is uh, going to look at the approximation of entire function classes. So for those of you who were in the 1990s and the early 2000s uh, in, in the whole wavelet, uh, you know, uh, wave uh, of, of approximation, theoretic results, wavelets and base of spaces and so on, uh, they know about those results that uh, wavelets optimally approximate functions from base of spaces. And then there is many other results, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that framework. And uh, we are going to be interested in uh, neural networks that approximate functions from a given function class. It's going to be a worst case theory. And uh, we're going to ask for the complexity of the network. And here we're going to be uh, much more or much closer to reality than in the first part. We are going to uh, quantize the network in the sense of uh, we're going to ask what is the number of bits needed to encode the topology of the network and uh, you're going to quantize the weights and the biases in the network and uh, you want to store the entire network in a bit string. So I give you a bit string from that bit string so you encode the network into that bit string and then from that bit string you should be able to uniquely read out the network, reconstruct it. So the network is going to act as an encoder for an element of that function class. Okay? And then immediately you will start thinking about Kolmogorov, epsilon entropy, covering numbers and so on and indeed there is a deep relationship. Good. Okay, so let's start uh, with the approximation of the squaring function. So the result is uh, as follows. Uh, you can uh, approximate the squaring function with um, a deep neural network uh, with an error of uh, at most epsilon with a network with a width of four um, and the depth scaling uh, logarithmic in the inverse of the approximation error. Um, here, this is a bound on the size of the weights. The size of the weights will play a very important role later on because when we talk about Kolmogorov, actually it's going to be Kolmogorov-Donohoe optimality. Uh, the, the scaling of the weights in the domain over which you want to approximate the function is going to turn out to be uh, crucial, but more on that later. Good. So um, the total number of parameters in this network is 4 times C times log 1 over epsilon. So what that means is that, uh, as you will see, in a second that we are going to get exponential approximation accuracy. But before uh, I show you um, this result, uh, let me just um, tell you about Jarodzki's work uh, who had uh, this result on the approximation of the squaring function. Um, so we have some minor um, uh, you know, improvements or modifications of that result, but uh, this is uh, the paper you should be looking at, Jarodzki 2017. Maybe the two things I want to mention here is that uh, relative to his result, uh, the, the construction that we have is uh, we get the weights of the network to scale no faster than polynomial in the size of the domain uh, over which we want to approximate the function, which we need for optimality later on. And the second uh, aspect we need is in approximating polynomials, in, in contrast to Jarodzki's work, the width of our network does not scale in the degree of the polynomial. And we're going to use a Taylor series argument later in approximating sinusoidal functions and uh, if the width would scale uh, in the degree, then uh, this wouldn't give us optimality. So this, these are the two things that are maybe new here. All right, so uh, finite width, four, uh, depth scaling like log one over epsilon. Now the total number of uh, non-zero weights in the network is upper bounded by this quantity here. So what is this? This is uh, the depth times W squared. Well, this is the size of the matrices in the affine transform. W squared and then uh, plus W, this is uh, the, the dimension of the, um, of the bias vector. So L times W squared plus W. And uh, if you uh, stick in 4 and log 1 over epsilon and you rewrite the equation, you get that the uh, approximation error uh, decays according to uh, 2 to the minus some constant uh, connectivity. The P is the, the polynomial degree. We'll later have, uh, instead of log 1 over epsilon, uh, poly log 1 over epsilon. But uh, here p is equal to 1 in the approximation of x squared. So the finite width combined with polylog in 1 over epsilon depth yields exponential error decay in connectivity. That's going to be uh, relevant uh, late in the talk where I will show you two function classes that are known to be very hard to approximate in classical approximation theory, uh, namely uh, the Weierstrass function um, and oscillatory textures. And the best known approximation uh, procedures, algorithms uh, uh, give you uh, polynomial uh, error decay and it turns out with a deep neural network you can very easily get exponential error decay. Okay. Good. So, um, 
the, the slide is titled Optimal Neural Network Algebra. Why algebra? Well, once we know how to approximate optimally, optimally meaning with exponential error decay, uh, the squaring function, we're going to take this uh, to approximate the multiplication function. Why the multiplication function? Well, once you have squaring, once you have multiplication, you can build polynomials. Once you have polynomials, you can do Taylor series approximations and so on and so forth. All right, so multiplication, we write uh, the product x times y uh, in this form here, y. Well, we know how to square. We know how to form linear combinations. Well, we have affine transformations available. So this is actually uh, just a um, composition of three neural networks. One computes x plus y squared, the other one x squared, and the third one y squared. So you can show that the optimality is preserved, and that's how you build multiplication. And then you go on and you realize x to the k through the combination of squaring and multiplication operations. And then you can build smooth functions through Chebyshev interpolation uh, combined with polynomial approximation. And finally, you can build uh, sinusoidal functions through a Taylor series approach. And uh, there is actually a, a twist that is important. And, and this is actually, um, you know, I, I, I held back and I didn't talk much about this, but this is where we fought the hardest with that problem because we need it in order to get optimality for um, the strong optimality result that I'm going to show you later. We needed uh, optimality for the approximation of sinusoidal functions. And so this is, uh, I would say, 80% of the research time that went into the paper was spent uh, on this problem. But never mind, uh, you can read it up. Uh, it's done now. In the end, uh, it's not so difficult, but what it uses uh, is actually the, uh, the symmetry of uh, the hat function that you can build from a ReLU, so a function like this, a linear combination of ReLUs, shifted ReLUs, and together with the symmetry of the sine and the cosine. All right, so uh, deep neural network approximation of function classes. We want to establish a relationship between the complexity of the function class C, the compact set, and the complexity of corresponding approximating networks. Uh, well, first we have to uh, say what we mean, or we have to define complexity of a function class. Well, uh, as I said, you will think of Kolmogorov uh, covering numbers. And uh, what we mean by complexity of a network? Well, the network is going to be encoded by a bit string, as I told you. It's going to, uh, this bit string is going to encode the topology of the network and the quantized weights. Why do we want to quantize the weights? Well, because we have to quantize in practice. I mean, you cannot use infinitely many bits to represent uh, real numbers. Good. The framework we are going to use uh, was introduced by uh, David Donohoe um, based on uh, beautiful work by Kolmogorov. The paper that uh, uh, I learned this from uh, is uh, this one here by Cohen, Dama, and Dobshi and Devor in 2001, where this is uh, looked at in the context of certain wavelet-based uh, encoders. And the basic idea is this. You have a function class, which is a compact set in L2 of omega. You have a set of encoders, or you have en valid encoders, valid decoders. An encoder would map an element of C onto a bit string of length L. So just a sequence of uh, zeros and ones. And a decoder would take this bit string and demap it back into function L2 of omega. So you think of a Kolmogorov covering numbers. You encode the ball centers. And then you know the radius. You know the maximum error. So this is the kind of uh, philosophy that is uh, behind this. We are going to use the, uh, the minimax code lengths, which is uh, the minimum code length such that there exists an encoder-decoder pair so that uh, the worst case error is no more than epsilon. And in particular, we're going to be interested uh, in um, this minimax code lengths uh, uh, scaling as uh, epsilon to the minus 1 over gamma. And we're going to look at the largest gamma. So larger gamma is better because it gives us a smaller growth rate. I mean, growth rate, I mean, when the error goes to 0. So when, if you want a more and more precise approximation, then you're going to ask yourself, well, you know, how does the number of bits needed to encode those functions scale when epsilon goes to 0? So larger gamma is uh, better because the requirements for storing signals uh, f in C uh, are more lenient. Good. OK, so here is the relationship to uh, kolmogorov tikomirov epsilon entropy. You uh, cover your set, and uh, you count the number of balls of radius epsilon. You take the log of that number. So that's uh, your kolmogorov tikomirov epsilon entropy. And this number depends, of course, on the radius epsilon. I mean, if epsilon becomes smaller, you need more balls to cover. And it turns out that uh, when C is not a finite set, then uh, your uh, H uh, 
epsilon of c is going to go to infinity as epsilon goes to zero. The question is, how does it go to infinity? And uh, in many interesting cases, it goes to infinity according to epsilon to the minus one over some alpha, potentially also with a log term here. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to ignore a log term or whatever have it there. Uh, so I'm just going to look uh, at uh, this quantity here. I'm going to look at the optimal exponent uh, and so this is a, a crude measure of growth, if you like. So whenever we talk about optimality, we mean modular whatever you have here that grows more slowly than epsilon to the one minus, uh, minus one over alpha. Good. All right. So now switching gears. So where was this framework uh, used uh, very successfully? It was used in dictionary approximation. What is dictionary approximation? If I give you a function class, for example, Bezov spaces or modulation spaces, so those are spaces that uh, relate to the short-term Fourier transform, and uh, I give you a dictionary, for example, uh, wavelets uh, or Gabor dictionaries, so uh, in, in physics coherent states, um, then uh, you try to find linear combinations in those dictionaries that approximate your functions well. So that's dictionary approximation. And uh, the, the question that you can now ask uh, is the following. Suppose you have a dictionary, a set of functions, and you want to represent uh, any function in your compact C as a linear combination uh, of elements in that dictionary. And you refer those uh, to those approximations as best M term approximation. Why? Because you allow M uh, participating elements in your approximation. And uh, in particular, you're going to ask for the arrow to decay like m to the minus gamma and for the largest exponent so that you can get this arrow decay. And that uh, exponent is going to be denoted by gamma star of c comma d. So clearly this exponent depends on the function class but also on the dictionary. In particular, it depends on how well the dictionary is matched to that function class. And that matching problem has been investigated very uh, intensely some 20 years ago, and I'm going to show you some of the main results uh, later on. But before uh, we um, uh, do that, let's ask ourselves uh, what is, uh, if, if any, there is a fundamental limit on gamma star of c comma d. Uh, so you fix your compact set, uh, and you are allowed to vary over all possible dictionaries. So this is the problem of dictionary mapping. Um, what is the, is there an upper bound on gamma star of C comma D? And the answer is no, really, because if uh, you take a dense and actually countable D, you can get gamma star to be equal to infinity, so you can approximate arbitrarily accurately. However, uh, this is not terribly practical. Why? Because uh, if you have a, a dictionary of uh, infinitely many elements, you have to search into the dictionary infinitely deep, and you need an infinite number of bits to store the indices of the participating elements. So that defines the whole purpose. Um, so what uh, a way around uh, this is uh, a concept that David Donahoe introduced in 93, uh, who defined uh, this uh, idea or uh, this concept of uh, uh, effective approximation. So what he said is that if you want uh, an M-term approximation, you're not going to be allowed to search the entire dictionary. You're going to be allowed to search the first pi, where pi is a polynomial, pi of M elements. So only polynomially deep into the dictionary. Uh, and you can already guess uh, what this is going to do to the number of, uh, so first of all, searching is uh, feasible. Second, the number of bits to encode participating uh, indices. Well, if you have uh, polynomial in many uh, elements, so polynomial in M, so then the log of that is going to be some constant times log of M. And so you can actually encode with log M bits, and then you have M participating elements, so it's M log M. I'm going to show you later. The second thing is uh, we're going to need a bound on the coefficients because we want to quantize them. And um, this will also show up uh, later in your network approximation. Um, what you need to do here is you need to control the error that you incur by quantizing the coefficients uh, in your um, representation. And uh, there is literature on this if you're interested. The way you do this is that you simply uh, show that this is actually a continuous mapping here, the superposition. And then if you quantize um, accurately enough, then you can show you can orthogonalize the participants participating elements, sorry, and then uh, the approximation error gets preserved because the condition number of the orthogonal matrix is equal to one. So these are fairly standard things. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because in neural networks, this is going to be a bit harder because we have to deal with nonlinear mappings. All right. So here is uh, uh, Donahoe's concept of effective best M-term approximation rate. 
you want to have a dictionary approximation, m terms. You want to have a decay of m to the minus gamma. You want to have a bound on your coefficients. And you're asking for the largest exponent, uh, and which we call now gamma star, effective of c, d. And you refer to this as the effective best m term approximation rate. So here's the question now. Uh, what, uh, if any, is the upper bound uh, on gamma star effective of c, d? And uh, what gives this gamma star effective of c, d operational significance is that indeed you can show it's upper bounded by the Kolmogorov exponent. Okay? And the question that we are going to ask ourselves now is what are dictionaries for a given function class that optimally represent effectively that function class in the sense that the corresponding dictionary for this given function class achieves the Kolmogorov exponent. And this is what I will refer to as kolmogorov donoho optimality from now on. Okay? And you can already see where the talk is going uh, to go. So I'm going to show you now what kinds of results are available for classical uh, approximation of function classes. And then we're going to ask ourselves, what are the function classes that neural networks optimally approximate in the kolmogorov donoho framework? Well, we cannot apply it quite because neural network approximation is something uh, different. So we're going to define this uh, concept uh, or, or the theory of, um, say, uh, extension of kolmogorov donoho um, approximation for neural networks. And then we're going to ask ourselves, what are the function classes that neural networks approximate. The neural network, you can then say, acts like a dictionary, and we are going to uh, find the Cs that neural networks approximate optimally. And the answer to this question will be essentially anything you can think of. So that's a very strong universality result. The neural networks are kolmogorov donoho optimal for essentially any function class you can think of. Okay? Good. But um, I will need some more time to get there. All right, so a back-of-the-envelope calculation, why um, uh, the choices that we made uh, lead to uh, optimality. So polynomial depth search, meaning log m uh, bits to represent the indices of the participating elements. You have m elements, so you have order m log m bits to represent the indices of the participating dictionary elements. You quantize uh, to integer, by rounding to integer multiples of m to the minus gamma. Why? Well, if you have the entire range bounded, then you divide by m to the minus uh, alpha, sorry. Then you have a constant times m to the alpha. You take the log thereof, uh, and uh, that's uh, log m again. And then you have m different elements. You have m log m bits to represent the quantized coefficients. And then you can control the error that you incur uh, through this quantization. All right, and then you can show that uh, there is an encoder-decoder pair reconstructing f from order m log m bits uh, with epsilon scaling like this here. And if you have an optimal dictionary for a given uh, compact C, then uh, you're going to get m log m to behave like epsilon to the minus 1 over gamma star times this term here, which we write this as O tilde. So this is actually ignores the log, and you get the optimal uh, exponent. Okay, so that's kind of the philosophy that we're going to follow. Uh, we are going to be interested uh, in uh, D uh, being replaced by neural networks, and then we're going to ask what are Cs that give you Kolmogorov optimal approximation for neural networks. Okay, but before we get there, uh, here is uh, a, um, an incomplete summary of what is known in terms of optimality results for given dictionaries uh, or uh, pairings of dictionaries uh, and, and function classes. So this is LP. Sobolev, Hölder, Bump, Algebra, Bounded Variation, Bezos Spaces, Modulation Spaces, as defined by Feichtinger and Gröchenig. Um, these are the optimal dictionaries. Here in square brackets, you have suboptimal dictionaries. So for example, here, uh, let's say Bezos Spaces, Wavelets, Fourier is suboptimal. And uh, so if you do Fourier, your gamma star is going to be S minus 1 half. If you use Wavelets, it's S. So it's really important, of course, to choose a matching uh, dictionary. So uh, as I already indicated, uh, at the end of the talk, you will see that, so, okay, so here is, uh, if, if you give me a function class, uh, let's say any of those, then, um, or, or if you give me a data set, and so I would view this as you giving me a function class, then I would need to know something about the structure of the data. Is it in a Bezos space, relation space, I mean, is it, uh, what kind of smoothness do we have, and so on. Then I go, I pick the optimal dictionary, and then I deploy my approximation algorithm. However, uh, given what I said before, if you have a neural network, uh, I don't have to know anything about the structure of the data. I just deploy it with the optimal learning algorithm, which I cannot specify and I do not specify. Uh, but uh, the neural network is going uh, to find it. And in some cases, actually, we can prove that it finds the, uh, the optimal dictionary even. 
those are stylized cases. Uh, I didn't want to put them up because uh, I don't think these results are strong enough to be shown here. Uh, but uh, they universally approximate uh, uh, you know, all those function classes optimally in the sense of Kolmogorov Donohoe. Okay, so what is it that we need to do in terms of modifications if we want to take this idea or this concept to neural networks? So we are going to replace M term approximation by M weight approximation. So the number of participating dictionary elements is now replaced by uh, the, the number of non-zero entries in your uh, weight matrices. So the, uh, the connectivity of the network plays the role of the number of participating terms. We are going to... Uh, have to encode the network topology and the quantized weights, and we will need to control the quantization-induced error. So that leads us to uh, this concept of best M-weight approximation rate. And again, we're going to let the error decay like M to the minus gamma, and we're going to look for the largest gamma and uh, refer to it as the best M-weight approximation rate. So there are two things uh, that uh, I um, talked about in dictionary approximation. One is uh, polynomial depth search. Do we need something equivalent here? Uh, no, we don't. Why? Because the tree-like structure of the network already makes sure that there is no problem there. Uh, how do you see this? Well, um, the, what is the total number of non-zero weights in the network? It cannot exceed uh, the depth times W squared plus W, obviously. So if the connectivity is M, uh, neither the depths nor the weights can scale faster than M. So therefore, what we get here is a scaling of at most order of M cubed. Now, how many bits do you need to encode um, m locations of non-zero weights uh, in a set of uh, m cubed locations? You need log m cubed choose m, which is order m log m bits. So the tree-like structure naturally gives you already what you enforce in dictionary approximation through polynomial depth search. So that's one. So we don't have to uh, care about that. The, the second one is... Uh, the, uh, the quantization of the weights, and uh, that indeed I'm not going to show you the results. You have to uh, work for this. Uh, the way you do it is uh, you exploit Lipschitz continuity of your nonlinearities, uh, and then you have to come up with error estimates. It's messy, uh, but uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's not very conceptual and not very difficult, but it's just a lot of work. So I don't think it's interesting enough to be shown here. Okay, so how do we let the depth scale of the network? Well, inspired by the approximation of individual functions, we let it scale like log 1 over epsilon. I mean, we have different choices here. It cannot scale faster than m. m is the connectivity. Since our arrow is always uh, proportional to m to the minus gamma, we are going to have the depths grow polylogarithmically uh, in m. Okay, good. So that, in summary, gives us best m weight approximation subject to polylogarithmic depths and polynomial weight growth. And uh, that, uh, you can again do a back of the envelope calculation, is going to yield um, Kolmogorov optimal, Kolmogorov donor optimal approximation. All right, so here is the exponent that we are going to be interested in is the gamma star effective neural network of C. So remember, in dictionary approximation, we had gamma star effective uh, of C comma D. So now the D, the dictionary, is replaced by the neural network. The neural network is now our dictionary. And therefore, we have this quantity here. And we are going to ask ourselves, is there um, a limit, an upper bound on this quantity? And it turns out there is, and it's the, the Kolmogorov exponent. So again, you see, if you pick and, uh, everything carefully, and uh, you can make it work all together, so as to give this exponent operational significance in the sense that it is upper bounded by the Kolmogorov exponent. And not only that, uh, you can also show that indeed uh, there are function classes where gamma star effective of neural network of C is equal to the Kolmogorov exponent. And not only that, you can, I mean, if you can find a function class that you can prove it doesn't uh, uh, satisfy this, uh, I, I would be delighted to hear about it because we couldn't. Okay. All right. Um, before I go into showing you what function classes, uh, or, or how we identified those function classes. Let me just turn things a little bit around and uh, uh, you know, put things into perspective that we have shown so far. What uh, you have seen so far is essentially um, uh, answering the following question. If you have this function class and your neural network is to approximate any element in the function class to within an error of at most epsilon, the question is um, how does the, uh, the connectivity in the network have to grow at least 
so as for this to be possible. And it turns out that uh, the connectivity has to grow at least as fast as epsilon to the minus one over gamma star as epsilon goes to zero. In fact, there is a, what I call a strong converse, physicists would call a phase transition, namely that if you exceed your gamma star of C, then uh, you violate this uh, error bound uh, infinitely often as a function of the connectivity. Uh, that, that's not surprising because that's, I mean, you cannot beat uh, Kolmogorov uh, covering. Good. All right, so uh, clearly in practice you use overparameterization and so on. I mean, so this tells you what you minimally need. Uh, and again, you know, we don't talk about training algorithms here. Okay, so um, let me tell you um, briefly how we uh, prove now the, um, that gamma star effective neural network of C is equal to gamma star of C for different function classes. Uh, forget about all that details that you will see in the next three slides, the main idea is the following. If you, uh, so, so the way we started with, was we knew, okay, wave flights are optimal for base of spaces. So now we, we somehow tried to navigate, you know, from known terrain. So we said, okay, can we approximate wave dictionary as optimal with neural networks? The answer is uh, yes. Uh, if you choose your mother wavelet uh, so that it can be approximated well by a neural network, then what you need is, what, how are the other elements in the wavelet dictionary generated? Through affine transformations and translates. Well, affine transformations and translates, well, you have affine transformations in your neural network. You just got to make sure that the neural network doesn't destroy the optimality of the approximation of the mother wavelet. And you can show that it doesn't because it exhibits an invariance property with respect to affine transformations and translations. That's it. It's all about invariances, okay? So it's not so surprising that you can actually show for uh, affine dictionaries, so not only wavelets, also ridgelets, curvelets, shearlets, alpha shearlets, whatever, they are all Kolmogorov don't know how optimally representable by neural networks. Okay? What is more surprising is that, so this is what I call the affine group, that you can also do it for the Weil Heisenberg group, where you have translates, translates, fine, but modulations, a uh, very different uh, group operation. Okay, and the way we do it is, uh, always through a sandwiching argument, namely, uh, we're going to first show what I just told you, that if you approximate this dictionary by a neural network, the, the gamma exponent you get is at least as large as the one you would get in dictionary approximation. So uh, you can be at least as good. Um, and then uh, you're going to use the Kolmogorov upper bound here. And then you're going to find the optimal dictionary for your function classes, which is wavelets for Bezov. You have gamma star of C here. And so you see that your gamma NN star effective is sandwiched between gamma star of C uh, and gamma star of C, and therefore you have optimality. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this is how we could do it. And then we went ahead and we did it for Gabor dictionaries, where you have translates and modulations. And this is, if you remember in the beginning, I said we worked hard to get this sinusoidal approximation right. This is where you need that result to get this optimality. And uh, also for the Van Heisenberg group, you can show that if you start with a generator that is well approximated by a neural network, and uh, then you translate it and you modulate it or shift it in time and in frequency, the optimality is preserved and you're going to get uh, optimal approximation for, um, for example, modulation spaces as uh, defined by Feichting and Gröchenick and uh, the optimal dictionaries here are what is called Wilson basis. I understand Wilson was a solid state physicist who won a Nobel Prize, but I'm sure uh, some of you know this. Okay, same arguments. Good. So here is the, the whole list. So this is uh, what we could show. For all these pairings, uh, optimal dictionaries for given function classes, you can do all this with neural networks, with one structure, okay? So forget about what the data structure is. You don't have to choose and find the right dictionary. The neural network will learn it for you if you have the optimal learning algorithm, which I don't, but if you do, then it's going to find it. So this one structure has a very, universe, a very strong universality property. It's going to find all these uh, optimal approximations with the minimum number of bits, okay? So you're not paying a price for this also. Again, always granted that you know the function perfectly and you have this learning algorithm. Um, two function classes that are hard to approximate classically, I mentioned this in the beginning, oscillatory textures uh, and uh, the Weierstrass function. Let me show you pictures and then you see this. This is an oscillatory texture. The way it's defined is uh, 
It's a cosine of uh, some uh, real number times a function g of x times h. So this is hard to approximate uh, because of its oscillatory nature. And the Weierstrass function, I'm sure uh, you know about, the fractal function, looks like this. And uh, so these functions are hard to approximate. And the best known approximation results, um, classical approximation theory, give you an error that decays polynomially in the number of uh, parameters you use in your approximant. It turns out, though, that deep neural networks approximate both oscillatory textures and the Weierstrass function with exponential accuracy. And then this result here was recently extended by Dobshi, Devor, and Hannon to more general fractals. In fact, you can show that whenever you can generate the fractals through an iterated function system, you can be uh, optimal with respect to neural network approximation. So to, uh, to wrap up, the last uh, item I want to show you is uh, the case for depths. So I want to be very specific here. Uh, there's no philosophical discussions here. Uh, what I want to show you is the following. Let uh, f be a C3 function, satisfying some additional condition. Um, then uh, if you restrict your neural network uh, and, and to have uh, a finite depth, L, okay? so let's call this a shallow network because L would be small, and you restrict the network to have a width that uh, scales no faster than polylogarithmic in 1 over epsilon, then uh, you cannot satisfy your error bound uh, of uh, f minus phi being less than epsilon. So you cannot approximate the worst case approximation error. is going to exceed epsilon. So the total number of parameters is going to be L times a polynomial log 1 over epsilon. And if you have a shallow network, fixed uh, depths and the widths can scale no faster than pi log 1 over epsilon, you cannot uh, do it. However, there is a result uh, um, in the two papers that uh, are underlying this presentation that shows you that uh, if you go deep and you have a finite width, namely of 23 in this case here, and again, forget about the details, uh, the only two quantities you should look at uh, are the depths, depth scales polylogarithmic in 1 over epsilon, the exponent is 2 here, this is the size of the domain, the width is 23, so you have a constant times log 1 over epsilon squared, and you can get the worst case error to be less than epsilon. So here is something that shallow networks cannot do, that deep networks can do. You stay with finite widths, and you go uh, polylogarithmically uh, deep. All right, so in summary, uh, deep networks give you exponential approximation accuracy for a very wide range of functions. So remember, we had this algebra, x squared, multiplication, polynomials, um, then we had smooth functions and uh, oscillatory functions like sinusoids. Then uh, they can, in principle, learn optimally vastly different function classes. So universality, one structure optimal for all these different function classes. And what is mathematically underlying this is a concurrent invariance property of deep nets with respect to time shifts, scalings, and frequency shifts. Okay, so affine group and the Weil-Heisenberg group, which means that you can, in principle, without knowing anything about your data, deploy this network. It's going to do as well as dictionary approximation would do if you had the optimal learning algorithm and if you have access uh, to your function or infinite amounts of data. These are the papers underlying this, so thank you very much.